Our next speaker gave me four words to describe him. He is the director of forensic architecture. Please welcome to the stage, a young Weizmann. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I, I, I really like um, the way you've turned um, the term genocide, but I think we need to remember that genocide, and we're living through, and we're living in a time of genocide. And I want to speak about living in a time of genocide, a genocide that has escalated, a genocide against the Palestinian people that we've seen escalated in recent weeks, a genocide that has began in 1948. But I want to speak about living through genocide, but we need to understand that genocide is not only those crimes of b the bombings that we are seeing in Gaza, genocide has a cultural dimension. Genocide begins with an attack on a culture. And what we are seeing here is an aspect of a genocide. When you do not allow Palestinian culture to exist, when you do not allow Palestinian voices to be heard, it is the first stage of a systematic attack against a group, which is, uh, which is genocide. And I want to talk about living through, and I want to talk maybe two scenes of dignity in the time of genocide. And one of those is something that I've experienced personally, the dignity of Palestinians living through genocide. On October 7th, my colleagues, uh, my Palestinian and Arab colleagues in forensic architecture and myself, it was a sunny Saturday morning. We met together in order to experience those events together. We do that as people that are committed to Palestine liberation, people that are committed to the fight against settler colonialism and apartheid. We develop a very strong, but also fragile, lines of solidarity between us, we try to experience events together. We met together, you do the round of news in Hebrew, in Arabic, in English, in German, in order to understand from all perspective what is happening, you start getting the social media um, signals from the area. Everybody is sitting together trying to figure out what has happened. My daughter, who is also a peace activist, a human rights activist, was with us. And slowly we started receiving news that her friends died or murdered, were murdered in the uh, Hamas massacre over the Wraith. I would like to express my wonder and gratitude at all my Palestinian friends from Haifa, from Janine, from Ramallah, from, from Gaza, from the diaspora, who have stood with her and who have shared in her grief at that day. This is dignity of people that undergo systematic at attack and harassment, continuous, and have reached out. And that moment has meant a lot for her as she was dealing with her grief, as, and we are dealing with the grief uh, at home. A day later, three of our partners, we have a very close partner organization in Gaza called Ein Media, it's a, a journalist filmmakers group uh, over there. We've gone missing, and we were asked to look for them. Our partners in Gaza were looking for them amongst the rubble and in the, on the ground, and we were looking for them as we do in forensic architecture amongst hundreds and thousands of videos that we could find online, and what we found was not good news. We've seen that they've been targeted and murdered by a drone strike on the first day, as they were doing their jobs as journalists reporting on what was going on. A few weeks later, the person who asked us to look for them Rushdi Al Saraj, a very close friend and collaborator who has worked with forensic architecture on several investigations, was himself murdered in a bomb strike over his home, leaving Sharuk, his wife, also a friend, 
and the toddler uh, daughter. A Palestinian colleague of mine who is a refugee from Gaza has lost three generations of a family. Initially in a single bomb strike over their home in Gaza City, in another act of dignity of living through genocide. They were told to leave their home. They were, they were leafleted. They were told to leave to the south and they said, we've been displaced once. The family comes from Ramla and we will not be displaced again. And they stayed in a house and they were wiped out. Three generations of the family. And then every day, pain after pain after pain, more and more and more friends and casualties, people that we know from, uh, from those places. And I cannot describe to you the difficulty of mourning and working around the clock at the same time. We couldn't really stop. We were working weekends, we were working nights, because what we do in forensic art is trying to analyze what is going on. We didn't even know if there is a sense in what we were doing anymore in the face of that horror. And what we were seeing, what we were seeing, as, uh, horrific scenes. We know that today we've crossed the 11,000 mark of families, civilians in Gaza that have been killed uh, in the bombings but these are only the people that are over the surface we are fearing that there are thousand more buried under the rubble of their homes and in those very deep craters created by Israeli death bombs because Israel's war on Gaza is not a ground war people are speaking about ground invasion in fact it's an invasion of the subsoil. It's an invasion of the underground. And the underground, unlike the ground that is so exposed to all those optics and hypervisibility, everything is documented, every millimeter, the subsoil for Israel is a dark space. They do not know where the tunnels are. And in the tunnels sit the Hamas fighters, and also their own captives. The way that they do it is by creating earthquakes. And this is what we are seeing. They're sending depth bombs into the ground. Those bombs are blowing up 30 meters under the surface, creating huge craters, sending shock waves that sometimes destroy entire street, or the effect goes in a kind of non-linear way to drop the bomb drops here and a house falls on the other side. It is an attack on a subsoil. And I find in that um, the idea that they know where they are bombing is absolutely incorrect. It's a lie. They are throwing bombs into a space that is completely invisible to them. And what is created is those casualties over the surface. And what fuels that war is legitimacy. The grief that Israelis did experience on the 7th of October is weaponized into a license and is amplified politically, as in amplified culturally, it's amplified through the media, and that is the full tank of gas. This is what allowed that war and that bombing and the genocide to continue. And therefore, acts like today, what we do now, is absolutely essential because it is the legitimacy that Israel has in its genocidal war is what they themselves call the sand clock. This is the time that they have. They have a limited time and we need to stop that time. And that time is based on legitimacy and therefore the war on legitimacy is not only rhetorical, is not only discursive, it is operating through actions like you see today, like arrest and harassment, that are indeed operating in the most brutal form in Palestine itself, with friends, with 
you know, the leader of my, the party that I support, Sami Abu Shahada, has been arrested yesterday. Others, other Palestinians are being arrested. People are being arrested here. You know, our partners in, in uh, Ramallah, Al Haq, the Palestinian Human Rights Organization, these are the people that we work together with and under their guidance in analyzing that war. This organization has been called a terrorist group, not by this government, not by Netanyahu. This is not a Netanyahu thing. This is supposedly the government for change that was before it. If you do human rights in Palestine, you're considered terroristic. If you do human rights here, you're considered anti-Semitic. Those two terms operate in the same way. They put you beyond the pale. Human rights calling for international law is being put beyond the pale. And those actions that we are seeing here are therefore continuous with what we see there. We are not sitting here in a different kind of conflict. I think that the war on Palestinians is a global war. I want to say global war, but actually it's not. It's a global north war. It's a war of the global north against Palestinians. And it's happening everywhere. And these are connected. We are not here in a, in a collateral event to what is happening. This is directly related. The legitimacy that is taken here would shorten the war. And um, in that way, I want to take away this stick that has been used to create legitimacy, that of anti-Semitism, and protest what Germany is doing right here, right now, by placing Jews at the fore as a reason, Jewish safety become a reason for the legislation, hopefully not, but looks very likely next week racial laws are going to be legislated again in Germany. Laws that are racializing, that are targeting migrants, that are targeting Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, people from the global south, in the name of fighting anti-Semitism. Again, racial laws are being legislated here. And therefore we need to say not in our name. And I want to end with a quote, with a Talmudic quote. Free, free Palestine. <laughs>